What's up, everybody? My name is Erin, and welcome to the Mad Maker Studio, and welcome back for part two of Where the Water Tastes Like Wine. Last episode, we ended on our first recurrent character, Quinn. I did not have any of the scary stories that he requested, so this time I'm going to see if I can cover more ground and collect additional stories to hopefully appease the next main character that we meet, whoever that may be. Okay, so this is where we camped out last time. Let's turn around and see what we got going on over in Massachusetts. Okay, and this, uh, there's something over here. I do not recall if we were already here, but this will be a good test to see if, you know, revisiting places is even a thing we can do. I'll hitchhike later. They don't come every year, you know. The old man is sitting at the edge of a rotting old pier, crooked legs dangling over the water. He watches a pair of seagulls preen and groom each other on a rock just off the shore. Ask why. Just when the fishing is going to be good. He taps great, black, thick globs of spent tobacco out of a huge ceramic pipe. I got another year, I guess. One more year of what? Another year of this town being here, he replies, letting a grin spread across his face. If the seagulls came, that means enough fish to keep it in place. Move on. All right, see, we did miss something. Okay, we're going to try hitchhiking and see how that goes for us. Maybe we'll get a good story from the hitchhiker. Well, alrighty then. <laughs> I guess we'll keep on moving. See what Connecticut has to offer. Hold left control to whistle. Supposed to be walking while I'm doing this. Oh my gosh. I, there's too many keys happening. I can't. <laughs> Sure I could, but it's going to take a lot of practice. I feel like I'm just going to be fumbling. Nope, no way going to stop for me. Well, it's probably for the best. Here's a little bubble over here. Oh, there's quite a few things over here. This one looks a little bit closer. Your story. These fellows are lounging in the front of a half-finished office building, taking their lunch break. Hey, one calls, waving you down. Rick was telling us this story. Listen, okay? And you tell if, it, tell if it's BS or not. Sure. Rick, a credulous seaman fella, starts telling you a story about the two brothers who wandered seeking one another for 50 years and i'm switching up accents because i guess that's just what i do now i think this is my yuya voice from how to a boyfriend <laughs> you realize it's the story of the two brothers who reconnected after 30 years apart but changed in a few major ways so it's definitely pot bs right but also a little real well I mean, it happened. The only thing they really exaggerated on was the amount of time. So I'm going to say it's not, it's not BS. 
Half the group groans. How the heck is that supposed to be a real story? Exclaims the man who waved you down. You're all the most gobbled pieces of poo I've ever met. <laughs> the other half of the group vindicated she has a bottle of pop with you. That's how you know we're in the north. They call it pop. I'm from the south. Everything is called coke. <laughs> All right. So the story grew in telling. Okay, so... I feel a little bad that that got exaggerated like that, but... Because we witnessed it firsthand. You hear the whippoorwill first, shrill and close. Then you see him, high up above the black streaks of wires. A lineman, fraying belt holding him to the pole. The damned bird has come to perch on a power line, stare hungrily at the man's soul. Well, that's not cool. Watch him. He's unsteady. His hands are shaky, and his body sways in the wind. You spot his tool bag next to the pole, worn and frayed, much like the man. A half-gone bottle of cheap rye pokes out of it. Okay, so do I walk away or take the bottle? I don't know. It's not clear, like, what reaction caused... Like, this will give me a different kind of story if I just walk away. If I take the bottle... I mean, he's obviously doing a dangerous job, so if I take away the bottle... Maybe he'll stop drinking on the job? Or he'll be distracted because I took the bottle? I don't know. Sure, I'll take it. What's he gonna do? Come down from the pole? You snatch it from his bag in one quick motion and walk away. Hey! He starts, but whatever he's about to say <gasps> slips into a slurred whine as his belt snaps. No, oh, see, dude, he was drinking on the job. Oh, that's a dangerous job to be drinking on. I'm gonna look at him. His body plummets. His limbs go slack with the understanding of what is happening to him. <sighs> he tumbles into the tall, dry grass by the side of the road with a muffled noise. All you hear is the call of the whippoorwill. Eager. Loud. Thankful. Well, great. Now I'm responsible for this. Ugh. No bueno. Um, let's check out over here and then we'll go into the Big Apple. Oh, I'm sleepy. A jet black crow alights on the low branch of a twisted tree. Look at you, it calls. Think you got some good stores already? Well, I heard better, much better, huh? It seems to wink at you. Wanna hear my tricks? Sure, I'll ask. I really want to ignore him, but I don't, like, I don't, what role does he play in all this? The ones you got now? Psh! Pathetic stuff. You tell those stories around and they'll come back more exciting, more satisfying, so always listen to the stories other folks tell. Their tales are less true, sure, but more useful around the campfire, hmm? Yeah, okay, makes sense. The boss has a point about the true ones, though, the crow admits. They're extra interesting. You learn a couple folks' true life stories and everyone will like them. No matter what kind of story they think they want to hear. Any other tips? Well, everyone's the captain of their destiny. It gives a burst of laughter. Ain't no bootstraps in the world that can save you now. But the choices you make, they change the kind of story you can tell. It ruffles its feathers, a sort of shrug. Choose wisely or don't. Ha! Move on. I'm done with you. I'm super sleepy, 
So I'm gonna turn around and see what New York City has to offer. Okay. The air stinks of gasoline and trash and you're boxed in by brick, but dang, there's something invigorating about that stink. God, you feel like there's an engine in your chest. Explore, earn money, train stations. Let's see, I'm I'm real low on sleep. Let's see if I can get anything at the store. Ooh. Earn money. You wander to the streets of the city looking for a way to make some cash. Panhandle. I'm gonna look for work. I seem to get some interest in stories that way. Well, I could get interest in stories too, a panhandling. But I'm gonna look for work again. Digging holes, not what you had in mind, but damn, they're they're digging a lot of holes in this park. A foreman assigns you to a work group with a mix of other disheveled men and women and sends you off to dig a pit by the water fountain. Keep quiet too, or what's this about? Nobody wants to say. A young woman keeps mouthing something to you across the hole, but you can't make it out. What is she saying? Dear Lobby, Dave Hobby, Dean Bobber, you never get anyone to admit what this is all about, but you do get paid pretty okay. Move on. Okay, let me go to the store. I want some orange juice. I'm gonna try and... I could get wine, but let me get some orange juice. And that took all of my money, <laughs> but I'm not sleepy anymore, so it's okay. Um, I did not check out the train station, but I'm gonna explore a little bit first. The engines belch black smoke as the ferry churns gray water into froth. A broad-shouldered figure leans out over the rail, eyeing the skyscrapers on the horizon. Nearby, a man and a woman speak in low, urgent voices. He takes her wrist gently. She is weeping softly. So we can either listen to the couple or talk to the man. Um, I'm gonna listen. I wish you didn't have to go, she says. There's gotta be work on some of those buildings going up. His thumb skates over her pulse point. I checked every day for a week. There ain't. I'll be back though. Got your picture in my wallet, don't I? It's not forever. I'm gonna keep listening. Her words are split by a sob. Might as well be. My parents didn't come to New York for this. She leans against him, the wind tossing her hair. He pulls her to his chest. I'm leaving because I gotta go. If there was another way... They stand together, close, quiet in the stiff breeze. Well, move on. Okay, got a new story. Um, let's check out the train station. Okay, so these are grayed out, so I can't like go back and explore a different area or earn more money. So I spent all of my money on orange juice, but that's okay. Uh, well, the store, now this one, Oh, never mind. I thought because there was a heart icon next to it, but no, it's, it's this um, money icon. Um, and the benefits I get are either the the heart or the sleep. So okay, let's check out the train station because we didn't go to the one in Boston. Oh, never mind. Okay, so at least we know this is a form of fast travel. And that a glass of orange juice is the same amount as a ticket to get me from New York to Boston, Washington, D.C. or Detroit. <laughs> All right. Well, since I'm not sleepy anymore, I guess that's cool. So we'll go ahead and leave New York City. Woo, a lot of time has passed. Oh, get me off that auto walk. I don't want to do that again. <laughs> that was a nightmare. Okay. So let me go over here by the ocean first, and then I'll wrap back around. Grab that other bubble before we go to Philadelphia. 
And then I'll see what how full my inventory is looking. The stream is a clear, reflective shade Ooh. of blue. Unusual in this region, where bog iron colors the river's brown. Across the way, a goat with great leather wings laps up the water, its sunken red eyes fixed on your every movement. Well, it looks like we're in New Jersey, so is this the Jersey Devil? Take stock? You now notice the unnatural absence of wildlife. No fish swim in the stream. No birds sing in the trees. The winged goat drinks with a forked tongue, only abstractly concerned with your presence. Well... <sighs> I don't know if I want to drink the water. <laughs> or approach it. Um... Since I, see, I already have like a couple of, of this icon, um, I don't think I have any of of this, the High Priestess, I think. So I'm going to drink the water and just uh, pretend I don't see it and we'll see what happens. You cup the water in your hands, ice cold somehow, and take a swallow, soothing the coarseness in your parched throat. Clear as the water is, the stream bed isn't visible, even looking straight down. Well, I didn't think that would lead me to swimming in the water. Um, never ever do that in real life, okay? <laughs> what can go wrong? Your feet don't reach the bottom, so you float in the cool water, feeling washed clean. The ripples flow as far as you can see never fading uh so we went down this path to avoid acknowledging the goat but now we're gonna wave at it and see how kindly it takes to us swimming around in its drinking water the winged goat snorts and heads in the other direction thank goodness let's move on <laughs> that's interesting oh nope Dang it, Aaron. You will master WASD one day. It will be a long process, but you will do it. <laughs> Again. You notice a black crow sitting on a fence post watching you with unsettling intensity. Hi! It blurts. Hi, Fran! Hi! You hear about trains? It gives a throaty cackle. Locomotion! That's the life. I got some good travel tips here. Sure, remind me about all of my traveling options, please. You ever ride a train? It asks. With your budget, you'll need to hop on at a train yard, though. Fast and convenient, but the railroad bulls really don't like it when you ride in the empty box cars. If you get caught, you'll get beaten. It hops around and pecks at something on the ground. Hmm. On the positive side, maybe you'll meet someone to trade stores with. But if you don't like the sound of that, you could hitchhike. Find a friendly car, it laughs. I feel sorry for you land lovers. No wings, just motors. You can't even cross the rivers when you want to. Only at safe crossings. You got a point there. I always do. I just, I cannot settle on a voice for this crow. You notice that its beak doesn't move as it speaks, but before you can tell anything else about it, off it flies. All right. Philadelphia. What y'all got to offer? Oh, there's two things here. Okay. The man is the color of mill dust. His smile creases his face like folds in dough. He gestures you inside the dilapidated structure, 
and shouts over the sound of driving wheels. You're welcome to sleep here. You don't want to rest by the river. Not in the evening. Insects. Oh, thank you kindly. We'll settle inside for a break. Man shoves the broken door closed behind you. The mill is warm, and the air is heavy with the powder kicked up by your entrance. You realize how easy it would be to drift off on this pile of sacks to the loud but constant sound of the grinding wheels. Now I could fight the drowsiness or sleep. We're good on sleep because I, I drink all that orange juice, but maybe if I fight the drowsiness, I'll get to talk to him more. Consciousness is elusive. Your limbs throb with a dull fatigue and your eyes are sticky with dust. The man suddenly grips your legs and drags you toward the millstone. What? You do not love my daughter. You will not have her. I will not let you hurt her. His voice is pained, not angry. I don't know your daughter. Fight. Your hand catches a flower sack printed with brightly colored flowers. A puff of flour makes you sneeze and you wake. The mill is quiet. It's works long disconnected. In your hand is the faded remnant of what might once have been a bag or a piece of a dress. Interesting. Oh, we got some scary stories for the next time we ever see Quinn. Okay, can I? Turn off auto walk. You can do this, Aaron. I believe in you. Okay. Your story. This kindly old man sharing the shade under the bridge with you tells a few rambling stories. Some true seamen, some conspir conspicuously less so. Conspicuously less so. I can talk. All true, he assures you. There's history in this place going all the way back to Indian times. Strange stuff happens around here. Can't all be true. Sure it is, he scoffs. And then, as if to prove himself right, he launches into a story about the Thunderbird people who fly when they fall from heights. Ooh, and this plays off from our, our bridge worker story from last episode. When they were talking about the Thunderbirds. And this one, you know, is the story of the bridge builders, but wilder and stranger than you remember. I know that one! See then, the old man laughs. I ain't pulling your leg, it's all true. <laughs> Move on. Okay, okay. Marilyn, let's see, is this the train? Hop a train. Hmm. Hop a train or go okay. camp. Well, let's look at our inventory real quick. Let's see what kinds of stories we've got. So I'm wondering, so this is flickering. Is this something that I've already told and I can't tell again or I really hate that it's flickering or no, it's just what I have selected my active stories. Okay. Since I didn't really finish get to telling that one. Um... Okay. So I'm still getting the hang of the mechanics and what all it wants me to do. So we have 12 out of 237 stories gathered. Dang. Okay. Let's see where we are on the map. Okay. Quinn is all the way back up there. Okay. Um... There's a new guy down here. Uh, I'll just keep roaming for a little bit. Maybe I'll uh, swoop down here. Maybe I'll, I'll find Quinn eventually. I do not like the way that he was shaking. <laughs> That's just like a, a glitch in the game thing. All right. 
still lots to learn, so um, I don't want to hop a train quite yet. We are totally doing that, though. But I still feel it's, it's early enough in the game. I don't have that biting need to fast travel. Yep. Ooh. My twin brother Paul and I always got into trouble, but we were good. We didn't do nothing to anybody until we left. Then we hurt a lot of people. Me, more so than Paul, because he, uh, well, he didn't make it through. Oh, are you a soldier? The march I was on, the bonus army. Yep. It's less a bonus and more an acknowledgement of what I've had to suffer. Civilians will never understand. Do you know any happy stories? Hopeful ones? Oh, I sure do. Let's see. What's this one? Bootlegging, lighthouse keepers. Well, I guess this... Son, the past memory is okay. Okay, this seems like our best bet. For a moment there, just a moment, I felt better about it all too. My family, they were good to me, Ma and Pa, and to Paul, and to my sister Jessie. Some days I wish I could find Jessie again and have her help me. She always liked Paul best. My brother Paul used to love scary stories. Tell me one. Oh, I sure got one of those now. Unless... Paul used to love that kind of dark campfire stuff. Home. Well, my sister, Jessie. Won't forgive me for what happened to Paul, so she won't let me back home. I made my own way for a while after that, so no one could afford gardeners. Who could stand to care for the land nowadays? Know any good jokes? I'm not so good at telling them anymore. Uh, do I have anything funny? <laughs> it's getting hard. I need more stories before I start sitting down at these campfires with people. Okay, so the closest thing I think I have to a funny is the Thunderbirds. We'll see what happens. That can't be true. That sounds like a Navy tale. Oh, well... I was waiting for him to read the line, did you get that out of a magazine, and then it never came. Whoops. Freedom is getting paid what you deserve, and getting enough to get by. Freedom is the ability to be free of pain. So anyway, tell me a funny story? You seem like you know a few good ones. Um... The women arrested for bootlegging in Maine might be funny. I don't... <laughs> I don't know. Sure. Oh, come on. That doesn't sound real. I, I was there. Authority? The law? I had a thought once, in the trenches. You, and I, all of us, have the right to the pursuit of happiness. Can't say I've held the declaration myself, but does it say anything about having a right to achieve happiness? Oof, deep cut. Tell me a happy story. Something to make the world seem kind, 
Oh, thank goodness. Been holding on to the lighthouse keepers in Portland. I like that one. There's some hope left for you too, you know. Don't give it away too quickly. The past doesn't even feel like it happened. It feels like it's happening in every moment, in every slumber. When your memories come back to you, do they clutch at you, at your heart? Here's the sun. I've got to go. I'm headed up the road this way. Will our paths cross? I'll make sure they do. Days come and go when the terrors return. They'll never be able to pay back what they owe me, but I'll always keep at them. What about you? Is there something somebody owes you? More like something I owe somebody else. Specifically, a wolf man. Ooh. And I like that we get to let's see if Mason shows up in our inventory, our stories. Yeah. So I don't think I got anything from Quinn, probably because I didn't open the eye all the way. Cool. I like it feels like an open world. Like, I mean, it's an open world. Which I don't play a lot of those games, so I suspect there's some sorts of, like limitations. Hmm. Here, let's enter Washington D.C. I'm getting distracted, and that's okay. It's hard to look at these shining buildings in the direct sunlight. You feel like an ant crawling among the tombs of giants. Away from the monuments, though, you find a city that's a little more human. Let's explore. The mailman's uniform is dated and worn. He sits on the edge of the road, head in hands. He looks up as you approach. Can you help? Car clip me. I think my legs... Well, I'd appreciate it if you could deliver this for me. He holds out a brown envelope. Deliver the letter. The letter is addressed to a James Gibson Sr., 120 J Street. But the city stymies you. The blocks run straight from I to K. He stop a man for directions, but he shakes his head and laughs. <laughs> Someone's playing a joke on you. There's no J Street. I'm going to keep looking. Over here. A woman in a brown coat overheard your question. She steers you down an alley. Someone's chalked a big orange J on one wall. I thought Clovis was late. Go left up ahead. Old man Gibson's the third on the right. Go on alone? As you round the corner, the world changes. J Street is a place out of time, like the city forgot an entire street a century ago and carried on around it, oblivious. Even the noise and bustle of D.C. can't penetrate this little pocket. Knock on Gibson's door. The man who answers is ancient and stooped. He peers at the letter. I think it's from my son. I don't see so well anymore. Will you read it to me? You tear the letter open. It isn't good news. You've got to tell him the truth. He fights it, but his face crumbles. Tears roll down his cheeks. It's better to know. I've been waiting a long time for this. His shaking hand takes the letter. Thank you for telling me. Move on. Let's earn some money. 
You wander the streets of the city looking for a way to make some cash. Look for work or panhandle. I've I've not panhandled yet. Maybe we'll get a story out of it. You're sitting across the street from a busy restaurant with a little sign on a plank of wood. Help me buy food. Most of the passerby give you nasty looks. There's a lady in the front window of the restaurant who can't stop staring either. Bad luck today. Whoops. Just as you're about to give up, however, you see someone... You see some motion inside the restaurant. The lady's paid her check and now she's bustling to the door. To your surprise, she makes a beeline across the street right for you. Uh-oh. You can't tell if she's excited to help you or pissed that you're here, but she slaps a pile of coins into your hat and starts machine gunning you with questions. What's your name? Who's your mother? Why are you dressed like this? Why are you here? Ma'am, please. She glares at you like a hawk. Glares at a rat caught in his talons. You look exactly like someone I know, she growls, maintaining eye contact for much too long. Exactly. And with that, she turns on her heel and stomps away. Strange. Generous, at least, but very strange. Move on. Um, I'm okay right now, so I'm going to go back and leave. Let's see. What's this over here? The hotel is an old manor house that's seen better days. A grand structure surmounted by a gambrel roof that dwarfs the house itself. It's eerily still, but for two boys at play. Each one so small and light, they barely leave tracks in the deep snow. Um, watch them? They seem old for their size, around ten years old. Though their clothes are mismatched, they're perfectly identical, down to the pattern of freckles on their pale cheeks. They conduct their games in eerie silence. Okay, <laughs> make your way inside. The clerk behind the counter is old, and your room key is worn. But night approaches, and the price is low. Just before you shut the room door, there they are, the twins, staring at you from the corridor. Are they ghosts? Get some sleep. Wonder if my money's all gone now. I didn't mean to do that. In the morning, as you leave, the clerk asks, Did you sleep well? I'm gonna tell the truth. Too tired to lie, you tell him about the noise outside your door. The trampling of small feet on the corridor outside. The dreams disturbed with violent and hideous images. That's odd, he says, weak-eyed. There are no children staying with us. Oh, little ghost boys not leaving footprints in the snow. Okay. All right, we'll try hitchhiking another day. going oh there's no one to talk to you hop off the box car and successfully sneak your way out of the train yard without catching unwanted attention nice move on where am i charlotte shoot we came all the way down to the carolinas This kindly old man sharing the shade under the bridge with you tells a few rambling stories, some true, some seem, and some conspicuously less so. All true, he assures you. There's history in this place going all the way back to Indian times. Strange stuff happens around here. And I'll be true. Sure it is, he scoffs. And then as if to prove himself right, he launches into a story about the dead woman in the yellow ribbon. 
And this one, you know, is the story of the elegant woman in the small town, but wilder and stranger than you remember. Yes, very much like the, the girl in the green ribbon. Does anyone remember that story? I still do. See, then the old man laughs. I ain't pulling your leg. It's all true. Move on. I don't even get an option to contradict him. Okay. Well, Carolinas is my home, my homeland. I wasn't planning to get here so quickly. <laughs> His smile lights up the room, or rather the cab of the locomotive. Folks gather round as he holds the pull cord. He's a showman through and through. You'll want to cover your ears now for this next part. Cover ears. Sure doesn't help much. Engineer pulls that chain and the whistle blasts inside your skull. He just smiles through it all. Man must be half deaf. Star nation. A round of applause erupts from the small crowd. He passes out bubblegum to the shell-shocked kids, <laughs> half of them in awe, half in tears. Get shuffled on. Remember now who gets you there on the advertised. Casey Jones. Everyone's all talk as they head back to their seats. That engineer sure is handsome. Gosh. And that whistle sounded just like a whippoorwill, didn't it? Ain't this the way to travel? Move on. Okay, so I guess I'm okay with, um... You know, like Quinn and Mason, I'm sure they're they're going to stay there until I go get the next chapter of their story. So I can afford to wonder about a little bit. Huge storm, this farmer gaffs, pointing to the clouded horizon. We got to get the produce indoors before the fields wash out. Can you help? You and his family strip the fields of vegetables. When the rain hits, you're all safe inside, and you've got some coins in your pocket. Nice. Move on. There's something way over there. He's small for his age. Boy of 13 or so sitting on an upturned bucket by the side of a tiny wedge of farmland. The dog, as though by contrast, is massive, an enormous yellow-brown mutt. He's called Rover, the boy explains. Paul says he can't come with us. No, where? Oh, I don't like that icon. West. You notice the Model A truck on the yard, piled high with furnishings and trunks and bags and knots of rope to tie it all together. And upon all that, too, yet more dust and grit. Paul says it has to be better. Why can't Rover go? I'm not going to like this answer. With one toe tip, he scratches a parabola on the dead, dry ground. Pa says we can't afford to feed Rover no more. You can't tell where the blonde of the dog's coat ends and the omnipresent dust begins. Same goes for the boy's hair. Will you take him? You can or you should. Rover follows you eagerly after you feed him the tiniest sliver of jerky. But a few hours later... He snaps to attention, as though hearing some distant noise your ears can't catch. The last you see of him are the markings left by his dirty pelt on the leaves of the underbrush. Mm. I feel better with that outcome, with him leaving on his own terms than by me simply saying, no, nah, I can't. And this is hitting me in a way because all of the dogs that I have in my house right now with me, they're all rescues. And there's three of them. They've all been rescued from a groomer. 
different groomers. Um, the oldest one was that one groomer, and then the other two um, we picked up from the groomer that we usually go to. And I, for the for the two younger ones, I could have left them at the groomer and said, "No, we can't afford this. We can't take it." But they just look so cute, and something just told me up. I don't mean to get emotional, it's just they, they put dogs in this video game, what do you expect? <laughs> but they're all three here, all three puppies or doggies are here with me and they're just precious and they're little butt faces a lot of the time but I love them with all my heart and I couldn't imagine being without them now. Move on. Oh, please have a happy story over here. I knew this game was gonna make me feel emotions. And I did it anyway, I played it anyway. The blistering sun has scared even birds into the shade. But a middle-aged woman and a young couple are still collecting scraps of cotton that the machinery missed. With a ragged voice, the older woman calls to you. You got any water? I didn't see any water in my inventory, but I'm a big old skeleton boy right now, so I don't think I need water. Sure. The three of them rush over to you, suddenly reanimated. They pass around your canteen. When you get it back, it's empty. The woman squeezes your hand and sighs with relief. Sweetest thing I ever tasted, she tells you. Move on. Okay, that picked up my spirits a little bit. <laughs> what is this? Was I already here? Huge storm, this farmer gasps, pointing the cloud is horizon we got to get the produce indoors before the fields wash out can you help you and his family strip the fields of vegetable when the rain hits you all step inside and you've got some coins in your pocket move on okay i thought i was already here i'm getting turned around again we in south carolina now okay i see a campfire i think in the distance down here. We can do this. We got this. No fence, gate, or sign marks the entrance to the cemetery. Just a moment ago, you weren't surrounded by graves, and now you are. How long have you been stepping on dead folks, fully unaware? Oh, observe a grave. A wood board, bleached white. Unknown. The word was painted on black by a steady hand, each letter signed with a flourish. Whoever made this memorial had more compassion than money. I'm gonna hold a moment of silence. You're already quiet, so maybe it's silly. But you instill that silence with intent. What else could someone do? Be still. A sparrow calls. Seems birds don't have much respect for the dead. You notice the grave marker isn't dug into the ground, just propped up on a tree. Right in the marker. Looks nicer now, but unmoored as these markers are, this grave in front of this tree does this memorial even belong to it? Good question. Move on. Faded shotgun houses sit in rows under the tall shadows of smokestacks. A worker in full uniform hollers from a porch. Hi, traveler! Throw me inside! Got some literature here. As you shut the door, the man glances out the window and draws the shades. 
Landlord toss you out? Ha, <laughs> don't mind me, uh, it's none of my business. He pries up a floorboard with a crowbar. Are you repairing something? <laughs> Watch. You glance over the man's shoulder to see inside the compartment. Canned goods, a pile of leaflets, the wood stock of a rifle. He replaces the board and stands. Look away. He hands you a can of whole potatoes, then a leaflet which reads, No evictions, no fascists, no hunger. Headed back to the shop, but we'll have a Bible meet soon. Bible meet? Bible meet. If you don't know James 5-1 by heart, learn it. That's our favorite scripture. I'm going to look that up real quick. Hold on. Okay, so there's a couple versions for James 5-1, but this is great. This is a great Bible verse, and astonishingly relatable back then and now and here it is look here you rich people weep and groan with anguish because of all the terrible troubles ahead of you there's like a lot of different versions of it and that's just one but it pretty much says the same thing so um long story short i like this guy move on Okay, there was one thing over here. So I think we can stand to do this one more thing and then we'll go camp and we'll call it an episode. Listen to this, blurts a boy loitering outside this grocery store. He works his way through the long and strange story about the blessed lighthouse sanctuary where souls in love could find respite. There, he finishes. What do you think? Wait a minute. Holy carp, you know this story. It's the story of the two lighthouse keepers, but wildly altered. For a couple of moments, you're too surprised to respond. Seriously, the boy insists. What do you think about that one? It's a great story. <laughs> he smiles sheepishly. Thanks, he said. I heard it from my brother. Move on. All right, nice. Okay, let's go camping because we are sleepy. We're a sleepy skeleton. Let's see who we meet here. Ooh, Jimmy. Evening there. You looking for a sermon or just a chat? Don't really matter, frankly. First thing I ever learned behind the pulpit is that every homily is just a conversation. Ain't as one-sided as you might think, either. Preachers ain't shepherds. They're cowboys. They got to run with the flock, keep them directed without fencing them in. So how about you take a seat and guide us somewhere? Sure. Hey, do you have any spooky campfire tales? Feels appropriate out here, right? I do have spooky campfire tales. I wonder if the creepy mill. Oh, let me see. I've told this one to someone else, so maybe... Oh, you got me for a second with that one. Nice. Home? Never had a home. Not the way y'all talk about it anyway. Pops and I had a little trailer for the summer he was wrestling in Atlanta, but otherwise, it was a new floor every week. You must have seen some pretty wild stuff on the road. What's the most exciting thing you've seen? Ooh. We got lots of options now. Story of Casey Jones, the theatrical railroad around Charlotte. Boy, Thunderbird. Oh, that dog story so sad. Silent Twins. Thirsty um, cotton pickers in North Carolina. Metal worker in Savannah, who's total bro. Um, that's sad. Something exciting. Let's go with this. 
you've got a pretty wild life. You know that? Oh, see, uh, Mason, I think it just took two stories to open the eye fully. Now it's taking a little bit more work, the more characters we start talking with. Authority? People look to me for leadership, but I tell them that real leadership comes from community. Facts. The best preachers are cornerstones, not prophets. Anyway, why don't you tell me a scary story? You must have heard some good ones. What's with you and the scary stories? <laughs> okay. Um, I think the closest thing I have to a scary story now is... The creepy mill around Philadelphia. Oh, you could rattle a congregation's bones, I bet. And I just remembered there were, I had a literal ghost story with the ghost children at the hotel. I could have also told him. Um, another time then. <laughs> family? My family was my father. Pops was a catch wrestler. You know, a real fighting man. Used to drag me around, town to town, brawling with whatever local pretty boy they put in the ring. He lost a lot, frankly, but had a mean crucifix lot. Lately, my journey's been pretty ordinary. Just walking, church to church. What about you? Been on any adventures? Well, I hopped a train once and uh, mopped a hospital. <laughs> uh, let's see. Tell them about the Thunderbird people. I swear I ain't heard a story good as that in a long minute. Freedom? I have it now. I hear it a lot. You give the best sermons I ever heard, Brother Jimmy. Why don't you become a pastor and start your own church? Well, I like the freedom. Jesus didn't preach to the Canaanites alone after all. Yeah, and that's some that's a quality he's sharing with Quinn. The the vagabonds are the most free people out there. You know, as far as traditional terms go, whereas Mason is longing for you know, to go home. But um him and Quinn are like I like the freedom, the freedom of just being out and about. I'm just so in awe with this game and I'm enjoying all of these characters so far. So no, no church or temple or praise house for me. My congregation is America itself. Hey, do you have any spooky campfire tales? Feels appropriate out here, right? <laughs> That's the third time you asked. Thank goodness I have three <laughs> scary stories, okay. Oh, you could rattle a congregation's bones, I bet. Yeah, and him and Quinn, the, the other quality they are also sharing is they have repeatedly asked for scary stories. <laughs> I wonder if the characters that we're interacting with here are going to communicate with each other while I'm roaming around the country. That would be kind of cool. And then hear their versions of their stories. I'm getting way ahead of myself. Bondage? Yeah met my daddy's daddy once. One time is all I needed to know that some chains ain't ever coming off you, no matter what sort of proclamation a white man in a suit makes. I'm encouraging everyone to play this game for themselves because there are so many great points to draw from it. Here are these stories, learn from history, apply them today and make a better future. Well, I gotta get moving on. I have a sermon to give in the morning, and the church is a long night of walking that way. Well, I'm definitely gonna see you again. I like you, fella. Walk like you're blessed, child. Cause even if you ain't, that's the only way you'll find your holy self. Amen. Oh, that was so good. Okay. I really enjoyed Jimmy's section. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and end episode two of Where the Water Tastes Like Wine here. I'm still feeling out the controls for this story, but I am absolutely loving it. And it 
all of the re recurrent characters that we are telling stories to and interacting with, they are woke AF. And I wish this game got more attention. I found it on a whim during a Steam sale, and I'm so glad I took a chance on it. All right, thank you again for joining me. I hope to see you next time because I am definitely going I'm, I'm in this for the long haul now. We are playing this to completion, whatever completion that may be. And however long it takes, I will make it work. Please leave a like, comment, and subscribe if you haven't already. And I hope to see you next time. Bye!